welcome to the ESI Africa studio. Today I'm speaking with Mohamed Badisi, Senior Attorney for Energy and Finance Power Africa. Hi, and Pleasure. welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you as well. Um, Mohamed, there is no one size fits all, but in your experience, what are the policies and regulations um, that make a successful uh, power purchase agreement? We have been working in Power Africa for the last four years on a project where we reviewed hundreds and hundreds of different PPAs. And frankly, the lesson that we've learned from that is that the PPA should typically be the most boring document possible. I mean, it's not an exciting answer, but it's the answer that we revealed. You know, when you look at all PPAs from transactions that have actually successfully closed, they look very, very similar. And when you look at the ones that haven't closed, you see where the differences arrive. So, you know, we've talked to governments, we've talked to, to bankers, we've talked to lawyers, and at the end of the day, it should really be a document that just summarizes the risks and the obligations of the parties and really doesn't require that much negotiation. There's actually a trend right now where a number of governments are pre-negotiating PPAs. They will have an open consultation with the private sector, they'll share a model document, they'll talk through the document in a non-adversarial process. They'll then agree on a model document and make it non-negotiable. And then in a tender, for example, that'll be included. So I think if anything, hopefully, you know, many years from now, we talk about this as a form document. It becomes standard in some way, and it stops being the source of delay and endless negotiation in, in the project development process. And attracting investments in, in Africa for, for large infrastructure, power and energy projects um, is a challenge for many countries, um, especially where there's a high risk profile. Uh, looking at the financial landscape, there's a lot of change and innovation coming out of that, especially with cryptocurrency is one of the big trends at the moment. Uh, but in your opinion, um, what financial model would be best uh, in terms of innovations for large infrastructure projects? You know, it's, it's a fair question. So, you know, obviously the issue of cryptocurrency is very popular right now. And we talk about it all the time. We get a bit jealous as lawyers sometimes because the, the engineers and the programmers come up with all these great ideas. But our job as lawyers is to keep things as simple and as predictable as possible. I, I would say where you're most likely to see the impact of cryptocurrencies is going to be what we call the transaction level, the payment layer in power projects. Right now, something as simple as converting currency, right? So I've, I've got a power project, I'm getting paid in Naira, Nigeria, I've got to convert it to dollars to pay my bank back in the States. That can take weeks, maybe even months at this point, you have to apply for a currency conversion to the central bank. If one can come up with a, what's a settlement technology, where you convert directly from the Naira to some cryptocurrency that's a basket of currencies or a basket of commodities, and then directly to dollars, and I could do that in minutes instead of weeks, you've shaved off a huge level of risk from power projects. So I don't think you're going to see amazing, you know, revolutionary funding technologies at a top level, but little specific pr procedures that exist in the projects today could be significantly influenced by the rise of cryptocurrencies and the use of, of blockchain technologies. And we're all hoping for it because at some point the technology is not going to get any cheaper. We have to start innovating in the financing, innovating in the legal risk. That's really where we're going to keep driving down prices and increasing energy access. And the average electrification rate in Africa is fairly low. Um, what policies and strategies can the region's power pools implement to create sustainable solutions to address this challenge? Well, it's a good question. I mean, within Power Africa, we have a huge you know, interest in power pools and huge support for power pools. Right now, they're at a very early stage in the market. I mean, the South African power pool, Southern African power pool, is quite successful. I mean, they're trading almost 25% of their volume at this point, so it's become more liquid over the years. But East Africa is less, less yet to launch, the West African power pool is yet to launch, and the Central African power pool is years away. The potential is really this. At the very early stages, power pools have a difficult job. They have to sort of be the arbiter within a region. They have to tell one state, you may have solar and your neighbor may have hydro. There's no point in developing both technologies in one place, sort of find a comparative advantage. But in the long term, the potential for power pools is huge. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. We're already seeing uh, in Central America some power pools that are procuring power at a regional level. So you're going from doing a 100 megawatt project to maybe a 1,000 megawatt project, and you're achieving economies of scale that drive down prices. So if countries can collaborate, and they can work together, and the power pools can regulate in a way that respects the sovereignty of the states, but still drives you know, economies of scale, you'll see it drive a huge amount of innovation and, and price pressure in the market to really achieve low cost power and again, energy access. Great, well thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Ashley Tehran, broadcasting live from African Utility Week.